I can't hear anyone. Well, that's no. Good afternoon, everyone, or good evening. My name is Garbo Hearn, and I'm a director of Pyramid Art Books and Custom Framing and Hearn Fine Art. We're located in the historic Dunbar neighborhood, and our focus is Black culture through literature and the fine arts. So we're excited to be here this evening through the lens of fine art with Marjorie Williams Smith. Uh, we thank you for being here. Welcome, Marjorie. Um, this exhibition, beautiful is six women artists who have mastered their various media and they are in different stages of their careers, but they're all amazing artists. And I encourage you to come by and visit the gallery and see the exhibition because it's one of those that you have to see for yourself. As we say, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And this exhibition is a great experience to decide where your inner beauty, what your interest in art and I will say, if you don't see anything in this exhibit that you don't love or like, then you don't like art. But I encourage you to come and visit. We're open Monday through Saturday from 10 to 4. We ask that you mask and sanitize and come and just come and enjoy yourself. But today, our focus is on Marjorie Williams Smith. And we are excited to say that Marjorie has been with the gallery for over 25 years. She's a former UA Little Rock professor and she has mastered the art of silver point. And we're excited to welcome you to share your art journey and just tell us about silver point and how you've come to where you are today. So welcome Marjorie and thank you for again for being here. Thank you very much Garbo. I appreciate that introduction and uh, I appreciate everyone who's joined in this evening. Um, I know a Wednesday evening is um, a busy time for some folks. And uh, I just thank you so much for taking time out to join us this evening. So I'm going to uh, share my screen here. Let's see, share screen and um, start in on my presentation. Hold on just a second. Okay. All right. So I wanted to um, share a little bit of my background, how my journey got started and um, how it has led me to uh, where I am today in terms of my art. So I'll start with telling you I grew up in Washington, D.C., and I wanted to show this image of the cherry blossoms in Washington because every spring, that, that seemed to be a big highlight for tourists to come to Washington to see these cherry blossoms. And my parents took my brother and me to... Um, to see these, they were, these were at the Tidal Basin in the West Potomac Park. And um, the crowds were just always incredible to uh, visit this. But I think it was a testament to how much we all love nature. Um, my parents would just, you know, every year, unless it was raining, uh, we would get to go down there and try to park the car somewhere and walk through and take pictures. And, and it was just a great time to be outdoors. And um, we frequently went down to the Potomac River in, in Haynes Park and just had picnics and ride our bicycles and we could see boats going up and down the river and see planes take off from the National Airport. So um, I always looked forward to those days when we would get to go down there and it didn't have to be a weekend even. We could just go during the week. We could even go on a, a weekday if one of my parents was off. So it was always fun. And I think that kind of nurtured my uh, love for nature. Um, my mom in particular really loved flowers and we did not have a very big backyard. So um, my dad built for her two small flower beds in the back. And I remembered her having petunias and four o'clocks on the red flowers and the marigolds. And I know she had several others. I couldn't, my brother and I couldn't remember what all they were, but um, just having that color um, was just so inviting. And she was always so relaxed back there and watering her plants. And uh, with the four o'clocks, um, they were called four o'clocks because they open up in the evening. And during the day they'd close, but then when it got to be toward dusk, 
we'd see them blow bloom and just have these bright colors. And uh, in the fall, they would produce these little black seeds, which would fall and you'd get more four o'clocks the next year, maybe too many. But I like to collect them just because I just like collecting the seeds. And I don't know what I was going to do with them, but I, I always had little jars of four o'clock seeds kind of hanging around in my room. Um, but I think both of my parents were very creative. Um, as I said, my father built those flower beds for my mom, but he was a carpenter by trade. And he worked full time for the United States Postal Service in their carpentry shop. And uh, when he had time off, he was still working. He, he took on odd jobs, um, remodeling people's basements and kitchens and porches and things like that. And uh, when I got ready for graduate school, I was going to move into an apartment on campus, but they didn't have furniture. So you had to bring your own. And he built this bureau drawer for me so that I'd have somewhere to put my clothes. And I have it to this day. This is actually in the corner of my studio and I get to put things in there and I don't think I'll ever part with it. So I'll have to hand it down to my grandkids. Um, my mom liked to do the needle work, um, sewing, crochet, knitting, um, she taught me how to do all those things. And it was really fun, but really practical because I made a lot of clothes that I wore to school. And back then it was really economical to make your clothes. That's not the case now. It probably costs more to make it than it is uh, to buy it in the store. But she made this little needlepoint for me of an asparagus fern because I had an asparagus fern in my first apartment after graduate school. And she gave this to me to help decorate my apartment. One thing my parents always told us was, you have to work twice as hard to do to get ahead in this world. And I'm sure any African American child of my generation heard the same thing, that if you really want to get ahead, you really have to work twice as hard. And they also said, do your best. So um, they never discouraged my interest in art. Uh, they never said, no, don't be an artist, you know. Um, they just said, do your best at it, you know? So that's what, I, I took that to heart. I really tried to do that. And when it came time for college, I had decided I was gonna go and become a commercial artist. Now that's what they called it back then, commercial art. And I was gonna do that and I was gonna design covers for record albums. I thought that was gonna be so cool. Uh, so um, I had my sights on the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And my parents said, no, uh, I think maybe you need to stay closer to home because that will fit the budget. And they said either Howard University or the University of Maryland. And I said, uh, Howard University. So that's where I went. And even though it wasn't my first choice, I think it was a great choice. Um, all the faculty there were very influential and, and gave us lots of um, skills that we could use later in life. But I chose these four particular professors to talk about because I think they really had a lasting impact on me. Um, Dr. Jeff Donaldson was my very first uh, drawing instructor at the college level. And he was one of the founders of Afrocobra. And I know they had a show here in Little Rock a few years ago. Um, so he was one of those founding members. But as a drawing instructor, he was very uh, disciplined. Um, if you could have met him. He was a very tall gentleman, well over 6'4", I think, um, had a very deep voice and was just very no nonsense. And uh, he really expected us to do our best work. And he was also my thesis advisor in my last semester uh, before graduation. Mrs. Asher was my second drawing teacher. And um, I took several classes with her because once I got used to her style of teaching, I really wanted to take more classes. So I took, I think, a couple of figure drawing classes with her and a, a perspective drawing class. And I tried to model my teaching style in drawing after her because she was really um, trying to help us to see clearly in terms of how to draw. Um, she went to school in Philadelphia and one of her teacher's teacher was Thomas Aikens who was a very strong realist. And I think that tradition was handed down to her. And, I, and once I found that out, I realized why I enjoyed her teaching style. And I think that really impacted my approach to drawing. Mr. Winston Kennedy was my printmaking instructor and he was also very 
no nonsense. Uh, I think that first semester I took a class with him, he um, was you know, very stern and very um, strict about his expectations. And I don't think anybody made an A in that class, although we kept trying hard. Uh, it was very challenging. And after that semester, everybody was, oh, I'm not taking any more classes from him. And I thought, I don't know. I think I, think I like printmaking. I, it's kind of cool, you know? So I signed up for another class and, and he came and he said, oh, you're back. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> uh, I like it. And he said, well, we'll, we'll see. Um, I enjoyed the, the shop, the smell of the ink, um, getting my hands dirty, just getting in there and doing those things just really uh, drew me to it. And I started to think, do I want to change my, my emphasis? And I thought, no, I've already got so many design classes. What I wound up with was a dual emphasis. I had just as many printmaking classes as I had design classes. So um, that had a big impact on me. And then Lois Melo Jones um, was my design instructor. And I took several classes from her. And I really enjoyed listening to her talk about her experiences as an artist uh, coming up in the 1930s and 40s and 50s. Um, she had a retrospective exhibition while I was there. And she told us about how she tried to get her work into museums and galleries. And they were, um, they refused her because she was African-American. Uh, she spent some time in Paris and was well received there and um, had an opportunity to meet a number of artists there. And she brought those experiences to the classroom and, and really encouraged us to not give up. You just have to work hard, keep at it. And, and that really had an impact on me. So when it came time to apply to graduate school, I, I thought about this printmaking thing. And um, the image on the left is a etching or aquatint rather that I did while I was at Howard. And um, reflections of self, it's a self portrait, but one side shows me being the student in the printmaking studio and the other side is me being the designer who always felt you had to be very professionally dressed and presentable when you go to meet a client. So I wanted to show those two sides of my personality. So when it was time to go to graduate school and make those applications, I went to my professors and asked for a letter of recommendation. And I went to Professor Donaldson and asked him and asked him would he um, endorse my application to Columbia. I wanted to go to Columbia University because Robert Blackburn was a professor there. And he was a uh, founder of the printmaking workshop in New York City, which was world renowned. And a lot of influential printmakers started there. Um, they had great facilities, but I wanted to work with him. And so I asked Professor Donaldson for this letter and he said, sure, I'll, I'll write the letter for you. And, and by the way, have you applied to Pratt? I'm like, no, I haven't applied to Pratt. Why not? He said, well, I don't wanna go there. And he said, well, I think you should apply there. And I thought, but I really wanna to go to Columbia. He said, well, if you don't apply to Pratt, you might not pass the thesis class. I'm like, no, no way. He said, well, I don't know. So needless to say, I, I applied to Pratt. And as it would turn out, Pratt was the only one I got accepted in, not Columbia. So I wound up in New York anyway, which was great. Um, my experience at Pratt was, was excellent. I enjoyed being there and I learned a lot. Um, and my emphasis was in printmaking. So when I graduated, I hoped to teach printmaking, but had no experience teaching printmaking. So I couldn't get a job as a printmaker uh, instructor. So I took a job as a uh, graphic artist in New York City working for a marketing firm. And um, I had had experience doing that while I was uh, a student at Howard part-time. So I uh, got that job and I didn't realize how demanding that job could be. I worked all day, sometimes overtime hours. And then I started doing some freelancing. So my nights were full, my weekends were full. I was doing graphic design nonstop. And I just had no time to actually do my own work. And after several months, I really started to feel that, that I wasn't doing my own work. And I kept thinking about that printmaking workshop. And I thought, well, 
I don't know if I'm good enough to get into the workshop, but I bet you if they have a class, I could take a class. That'd be a way in and I'll pay for the class, right? So I'm paying to be there. So I called them up and uh, they, I said, do you have classes in, in the lithography? And they said, yes, we do. I'm like, great. So he put the teacher on the phone and we talked. He said, bring in your portfolio and, and we'll see. Like, oh my gosh. So I got my portfolio together and I went there after work one day and uh, showed him my, my uh, portfolio. And as it turns out, that was AJ Smith, who, is, uh, who became my husband a couple of years after that. Um, but I really enjoyed being in the workshop. I mean, I got to see professional printmakers working, creating editions of prints. And AJ was a master printer, so I learned so much from him about the printmaking process. And I got to meet Robert Blackburn, you know? So I still got to, to meet him and to work a little bit with him. Um, and it just, it turned out as it was supposed to turn out. So I was really grateful for that experience. So we lived in New York for several years. And um, one day AJ came home and said, um, I've been offered to, uh, an opportunity to interview for an artist in residence position at the Arkansas Art Center in Little Rock, Arkansas. And I thought, hmm, okay, how, how long might that residency be? And he said, well, for a year, like a year, we'd have to move. <laughs> he said, yeah, <laughs> you think? And I said, well, I don't want to move to Little Rock, Arkansas. You know, I mean, you can go there for the interview and think of it as vacation, but I'm not going to move there because the only thing I could think about was the Little Rock Central High Crisis. And I said, I don't know that the community has changed and that they are really receptive, you know, to, you know, things as, uh, as we'd like for them to be. And he said, well, no, I think they really want me to come. I think would be great. We can only, we can go for a year. If we don't like it, we can come back to New York. I said, okay. And as it turned out, I had recently found out we were expecting our first child. So I said, okay, I'll take a break from graphic design, have a year off, have a baby, you know. I, mean, I didn't know how tough having a baby was. So that's another story. But uh, so we moved to, to Little Rock and we stayed. So one year turned into two and, and we're still here. So, um, but during that time that when we first moved here and I had this free time, I, I started to think I need to get back into the studio. So I think I'll start drawing. And I had this dried rose sitting on my desk and the, the stem had broken off. So it was pretty fragile. So I thought maybe I'll draw it and that'll be a way to, to preserve it. So I drew it and it was kind of fun. I did it in pencil. And uh, I thought, well, that was pretty fast. I think I'll do another one. So I did another one and another. And, and after a while, included other types of flowers. Um, so I started to have a little bit of fun with that. And I could do it when the baby was asleep. And after she was born, I could take that time and, uh, and do a little, little bit for myself. Well, later in the 1980s, several things happened that I feel were very important. One, I had the opportunity to meet Elizabeth Catlett and she had always been one of my idols. Uh, I loved her work. I saw her a sculpture when I was at Howard, uh, but when I got to Pratt, I found a book about her prints and her lithographs and they, they were just stunning and really inspired the work that I was doing in printmaking. So she came to Little Rock uh, I think it was around 1984, 85. I'm not exactly sure on that date, but she did a workshop at the Arkansas Art Center. And I had an opportunity to meet her, uh, see her working in the print studio they had at the time. And I just, it was like a dream come true. So that was very, very important to me. Also in 1984, I was uh, awarded a teaching position at the University of Arkansas, Little Rock. And I'd always wanted to teach college, but I wasn't teaching printmaking because that position was already taken. So I wound up teaching graphic design and I'd had um, you know, several years of working as a graphic artist. So it worked out really well. And this was way before computer. So everything was done by hand. I had to teach students how to prepare their artwork for the camera 
ultimately that would be used in the print process. So I, I had all those skills ready. And then in 1985, the Art Center had an exhibition called The Fine Line, Drawing with Silver in America. And I believe this exhibition changed my life in terms of my art um, future, because this show was absolutely stunning. I had never seen anything like it before in my life. Um, I went in not knowing what to expect, but I'd heard about Silver Point Drawing and um, heard about it in my art history class, you know, but, and that was like, you know, ancient history more or less, but here were contemporary artists doing this type of drawing. And I was floored. I mean, some of these were just so ethereal. The lines were so incredibly thin. It, you, it was like somebody just breathed the drawing into, onto the page, particularly this drawing by Leo D. Um, when I looked at it up close, you couldn't even hardly see the lines that created this image. Um, it, and it's just so subtle, the handling, I just couldn't, I couldn't even believe it. And then when I saw this drawing by Harvey Dinnerstein of this amaryllis plant, I thought, there you go. That's gonna be perfect for roses. I know I have to use this. So uh, I went ahead and um, kept touring the exhibition. I saw this image by Susan Schwab. Um, and she did non-representational work, but here you had silver point and smoke. It's like, how in the world do you, do you draw with smoke? I don't even know. <laughs> so, uh, and then the still life images by uh, Laura Schechter. Um, it was just so incredible. Her control with value and, and um, I just love those compositions. So I thought, okay, that's it. I've got to do this. I bought the um, catalog for the exhibition. I went back to the show many, many times while I was there. And I said, that's it, I'm gonna do Silver Point. So I went to the art store and uh, I said, I need some Silver Point supplies. And they said, what? <laughs> I said, Silver Point supplies? I don't know if any of you remember Junkins uh, before it was Art Outfitters, but uh, they did not know what I was talking about. So okay. So I went back, read that catalog again, and I thought, well, now I have paper. I have some gesso. I know I need to coat my paper with gesso. And I had a silver ring that was my mother's. And I think, hmm, I know she would support my art ventures. So I took it apart, made a tool out of it, and used that for uh, my early drawings. So let me just tell you a little bit about history as it relates to Silver Point. Um, metal point really dates back to antiquity. And artists used metals for their drawing because they didn't have graphite at that time. Graphite wasn't discovered until uh, the mid 16th century in the UK. So they were using uh, chalk, they were using charcoal, and they were using metal. And um, in order for the drawing to actually happen on the surface that they were using, they had to put some sort of coating on it, some sort of ground. And what they did in terms of making that ground, they used pulverized bones like chicken bones. Um, they used animal skin glue or saliva as a binder. And they would add maybe some uh, pigment to that to add color. All right, so they applied this coating to the surface, maybe parchment or vellum, and as many as nine layers of that coating before they would actually start drawing. And as you can see these examples by Leonardo da Vinci and Raphael, that um, they were able to leave marks. And particularly with this um, da Vinci piece, you can see these patched lines that he used to build up these values. So that's how they got these um, values from light to dark to try to describe the form. And then if they had tinted that background, um, then they would go in with white maybe chalk to highlight the form, highlight those areas, they really give it a dimensional quality. So um, as I said, I went back to that catalog many times to really learn more about the history, the, the materials that they use so that I might be more informed about how to go about it. So let me just um, show you how this actually works, have a little video. So now what I'm using is silver 
on a page that has been commercially prepared. You can buy paper from uh, Dick Blick, an art supplier, that you can just go ahead and, and create your drawing and made lines on the page so you can see how these hatch lines happen. I'm not scratching into the surface. Um, I'm not etching anything. What's happening is the surface, because it has that ground on it, is just abrasive enough that little minute particles of the metal are being deposited when, I, when I'm drawing with it. Okay. So here you have an example of some of the tools that I use. I have um, different gauges of silver point so that I can make a very um, thin line or maybe something that's a little bit more pronounced. And um, I put them in a stylus holder. So that allows me to uh, keep the tool secure. And I also have some metal point tools. I have copper, I have gold, and here's an example of aluminum. What's the difference between silver point and, and metal point? Well, these terms are kind of used interchangeably. Sometimes silver point relates to whatever metal that's being used, but specifically, I think of silver point as using silver. And then the metal point might be any other type of metal. So I most frequently use copper, gold, and aluminum in my drawings. And here you can see several other materials that I use. Uh, in terms of the grounds, I have used white acrylic gesso, uh, black ac acrylic gesso. There's even a silver point drawing ground, which is produced by Goldens. And then Frederick's gesso ground mix. Um, I think this relates more closely to some of the traditional grounds that were used by the Renaissance artists in that it contains crushed marble, animal skin glue, which acts as that binder, and then there is titanium white that gives it a, a white color. So all I have to do is add water and I'm, I'm ready to use that as my ground. And I find it to be a little more abrasive than acrylic gesso. So that's why I like to use it preferably. Um, you can see my tools, the gold, aluminum, silver, copper. I label them because sometimes I'm, I'm in a hurry. I grab something and I'm, wait a minute, is this silver? Is this, is this aluminum? I have, to, I have to check. So I label them so that it makes it easy. You can also leave marks using wire brushes. So you see I have a brass and a stainless steel brush. They will also leave marks, as will copper wool and the steel wool. And the little... Um, piece in the middle there, that little square is a sample of uh, a board with some tinted gesso on it, ready to go. Now here I am coating one of my uh, papers with my gesso and I've been working with um, a 300 pound Fabriano watercolor paper, hot press. So it's very smooth, very sturdy. Uh, I still like to stretch it as I would if I were preparing for a watercolor uh, painting. So I soak it, um, put it in the bathtub, let it get wet, and then blot out the excess moisture, put it on a, a wooden block board there, and tape it down with gum paper tape. Once that's dried, then I'm ready to go in and coat that with my, my gesso ground. And I usually put six coats of ground on there before I really am ready to start doing anything, and, and I'll sand the uh, gesso after that last coat. So here's one of my early silver point drawings. And um, I combined the silver point tool with pencil because I wanted to show a, a contrast between the cool gray of the pencil in the head of the pen versus the, the tone of the silver. And over a period of time, silver will tarnish. And all of these metals have a very a different oxidation rate. Now, if you have a silverware um, set or a tea service, you probably know that you have to polish your silver after a while because it gets dark. And that's what's happening with these drawings. So even though I'm finished with a drawing, it's still alive to me, you know, because it's tarnishing, it's still doing something, it's still changing, it's still uh, growing, and it feels alive. So um, this is from 1987. I still have this drawing and 
I look at it and I can really see the differences between the, the pencil and that silver. And, and that's one of the cool things about it for me. Okay, let's see. Here's another one from 1990, still experimenting, just getting used to how to handle making the marks. Now, when I was in drawing class and, and we were using pen and ink and we would do hatch lines and we'd go one direction then we'd go the opposite direction and maybe vary that a little bit. And when I tried to do that approach with the drawing of the flowers, it didn't really work. You know, the forms really just didn't seem to, to evolve like I wanted them to. So I had to relearn how to do this hatching. And what I found was that the marks can't just be straight. The marks have to curve. And that really started to build this, this form even more. So this drawing I felt was much more successful. Now this one was done on acrylic gesso, six coats, sanded after that sixth coat. It was so smooth it felt like glass. And so as I started drawing on it, I had a hard time getting the values to really take because it was so, so slick. Um, but I used silver, copper, and gold. And I used copper in the, uh, in the petals of the rose. And copper over time has a tendency to fade. So over time, these petals got lighter in value. Um, and I don't know if you can tell on your screen, but at the lower part of the drawing, there's this very light value gray. And I used the steel wool and just kept rubbing, rubbing, rubbing like this over that area to build up a value. And then I went back with my eraser and erased out the value in the leaf, uh, those leaves at the very bottom so that I could get back to that white surface. So I called it trio because the way they, this was arranged seemed very lyrical. And I had them sitting in some styrofoam to keep them in place so they were actually in front of me as I was drawing. And I just loved this so much. Um, this drawing has a story. Some, some drawings have a bigger story than others, but this one has a special story. I had learned that the Arkansas Art Center was um, hosting an exhibition by two artists that um, did Silver Point. And their name was uh, Charles Schmidt and George Soros. They had this exhibition. I think this was about 1998. I'm, I'm not exactly sure of the date. Um, no, it was 89, I'm sorry. So I found out about the workshop and I thought, oh, I'd love to go. I need to learn more about what I'm doing. And so I called them and they said, yeah, it's on a Saturday. It starts around uh, 9.30 and, and it'll be all day. And I thought, oh no. By this time we had two, two daughters. Um, my husband was teaching a Saturday class at the university. So that just kind of said, okay, I'm not gonna get to that workshop. But then I thought, wait a minute, they're gonna have to take a lunch break, right? So I called the art center again and said, are they gonna, are they gonna take a lunch break? I said, yeah. Great. Can I come up during their lunch break and uh, ask them some questions? He said, sure, why not? That's fine. I said, great. So I loaded up the girls, get in the car, we go to the art center and during, during their lunch break, and uh, I asked them some questions about where to buy materials and so forth. And, and I told them I had been doing silver point drawings and they thought, really, that's, that's, you know, we don't see that all the time. People just, you know, out in the doing Silver Point. And I'm like, yes, well, I saw the Fine Line show, which they knew about that show. And they said, well, we would have loved to have seen some of your work, you know, I'm sorry, we couldn't see it. I said, well, really? They said, yeah. I said, well, as it happens, I only live a few blocks away. I could bring my portfolio uh, if you have a few more minutes. And they said, okay. So I took the girls, we went home, I gave them some peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. We, I loaded up my portfolio and we zoomed back to the art center. And this particular drawing was in my portfolio. So I showed them the work and I'm like, wow, okay, not bad. Like, so do you have any advice? I said, no, just keep doing it. I'm like, that's all, that's it. <laughs> I thought they would you know, give me something else that I could work with. And they said, no, just keep working. Said, okay, well, Charles Schmidt, a couple of years later, was organizing a traveling exhibition of Silverpoint work. 
And he remembered this drawing. And so he contacted me through the art center and asked if he could include this drawing in that exhibition. And I'm like, he remembered me, oh my gosh. Yes, you can put that in the exhibition. So this, is, this was the uh, exhibition catalog there to the right. Um, the show was Silver Point, et cetera, uh, Contemporary Metal Point Drawings. And it started out at the Arkansas Art Center and then it traveled to Alabama and then went to Maine and then they added a show in Philadelphia. So that was my first opportunity to be in a national Silver Point exhibition. So I really felt that I had accomplished something really significant. This drawing, uh, Whisper to One, was also in that exhibition. And this was my uh, influence of Susan Schwab's work on me, uh, trying to incorporate smoke into my drawing. And I had this rose that only had one petal still holding on to the stem. And I thought, well, this would be perfect. Now, if I could get the smoke on there and also maybe have it kind of like a pattern, I just didn't want just a stream of smoke. So I had a paper doily leaf that I put over top of the, the drawing and had my candle with the smoke all near this drawing. And I thought, you know, I could burn this up. And I thought, well, I'll just draw it again. So uh, I gave it a, a shot and it, and it worked out. It didn't, it didn't burn up. So I felt pretty good about that. And then um, in 1999, a former student of mine, Joey Holinsky, contacted me out at UALR and said that the United States Mint was looking for some um, proposals for design for the Congressional Medal of Honor that would be given to the Little Rock Nine. And would I be interested in submitting a proposal? And I thought, sure, that, that sounds interesting. Sure, I can do that. And my mind started thinking, hmm, there's so many pictures out there I could use, you know, to, to create this. So um, she gave me the contact information. I contacted uh, the person and they said, yes, we're accepting proposals. And, uh, but you cannot use any pre-existing photo phot uh, photography. Oh, okay. Well, there went all my pre-existing uh, you know, ideas that I had, because I thought I cannot use any photos of them as students going into the school. So how am I going to do this if I can't use that? So I went over to Central. I started taking pictures of the school. And then I thought, well, you know, if I show them going into the school, but from behind, so you don't see anyone's face, and then I don't have to worry about trying to get a photo or making it look like them. So I asked my husband to pose as a soldier uh, at the school and then we took a broom over there that he could hold it like a rifle and had him stand in varying locations on the steps. I also had my daughter put on a poodle skirt. My daughter Nyla um, had a poodle skirt for a slumber party or something. And it was very consistent with the style of fashion at that time. So she posed for the female figures. And I did this sketch and um, finished it out in ink and submitted it. And sure enough, they selected that design for the medal. And I was just so honored. I, I did the, the front and the back um, and it was given to the Little Rock Nine in November of 1999. And I think it's pretty ironic that I didn't want to move here because of Central High. And then as it turns out, I do the medal <laughs> given to the Little Rock Nine. So, I mean, you can't plan things you know, I, I've, I've now realized that things that have happened in my life is not because I planned it, but there was a divine plan in play. And I am very grateful for that. Um, here you have several catalogs from um, other exhibitions that I was included in. Um, the one on the far left is titled The Luster of Silver, which was held in Savannah, Georgia. And then it traveled to Evansville, Indiana. And, um, the one on the far right is the Silver Point exhibition that was at the um, National Arts Club in um, New York City. So, uh, and then the Two Artists, Two Visions was an exhibition that my husband and I had at the Evansville Museum a few years later uh, after the Luster show. And uh, we were so happy to, to be able to display our work in that museum. 
Um, sometime after the luster of Silver Show in Georgia, Susan Schwab and I um, started communicating. And she had seen my work in that Silver Point Etc. show. She was also in that exhibition. So I was just really honored that you know this established Silver Point artist uh, wanted to, to communicate with me. And so um, we were exchanging letters and um, eventually email. And so one day Susan sent me an image that was on a black background. I don't, don't remember if it was this image or one like it, but um, as soon as I saw it, I thought, what in the world? This is absolutely incredible. What did you do? How did you do this? And all she said was, buy some black gesso. I'm like, okay, I'm game. So I went and got some black gesso. Now, I didn't even know they, they made black gesso, but I, I tried it. And as you can see in this video, the metal really shows up. It doesn't look like a gray mark on a white background. You actually see the metal. And I thought, wow, this, this is like drawing in reverse, right? Because now I, I have to draw the light, not the shadows. So I started out here in this video with the silver and now I'm using gold. And can you see the color difference that's starting to happen? Um, the gold is warm. You actually see the color of the metal, I think, with these, uh, and it's on this black background. This next one is uh, aluminum. And making the mark with aluminum, I've done several drawings with this. And you hear the sound as I'm making the mark on the page. As, as I said earlier, I'm not digging into that surface. I'm just moving the tool back and forth. And that gesso is just abrasive enough that I'm able to leave marks. And as I build up those marks, you can see how that value gets, gets lighter. And it really is dependent on the light in your environment to really see what's going on in the image. The copper, it starts to look more red um, as you build up the, the metal. And so I thought, okay, I'm gonna have to really think about this because this is not my usual drawing process. I'm having to draw light not shadows. So that was a challenge. So this was one of the first drawings that I did um, on a black background. And the, the image really took on a whole different characteristic. It started to feel um, mysterious and um, pensive in a way. And I called this early series um, Nocturne because they felt very pensive and, and just really made you think about these in a very different way. It was as if they were in their, a, a different reality than what had happened when it was on a white background. With this particular one, I used the aluminum point to really build up the light within the blossom of this flower and really had to control how I handled those leaves, really pulling back on the marks just gradually building up that value, really taking my time and really having kind of thinking ahead. Where am I going with this? Is this enough? Do I need to add more? Because I cannot erase that off. If I had tried to erase it, it would have totally disturbed the ground. And I didn't want that to happen. It would have spoiled it. So I really have to be methodical when I work. Um, in 2012, I had the opportunity to actually meet Susan Schwab. Uh, I submitted a faculty research grant proposal uh, to the university and it was accepted. So I was able to travel to New York and meet Susan and visit her studio and see her artwork in person. And it, it is gorgeous when you see any of these works in person. So we got to build a, our friendship from that point on, we are in contact all the time. And this is us at the National Arts Club in New York at the opening reception for that exhibition. So she's been a very good friend and a mentor to me over the years. This particular drawing also has somewhat of a story. It's a shorter story though. Um, it was reproduced in the um, American Artist Drawing Magazine. I don't think that magazine is in publication anymore, but um, 
they used this as they were citing examples of Silver Point on a dark background. And I was just so happy that one of my works was included in the magazine because I always loved it, even back when I was in college, loved American Artists Magazine. Uh, I used aluminum point in this drawing where I really trying to build those values. You can see the light there and the, the uh, shadow areas. And this is of a canis plant. I have some canis plants in my backyard and um, so I've done several drawings of the canis plants. I just love those large leaves and the, the veins you can see kind of coming through there and really can describe that. And then I, I wanted to break away a little bit from that black background. So I experimented with color and I was able to apply the blue in this using gouache. So I kind of masked off the area where the flowers were going to be and went over it with a wash of blue gouache. And uh, really liked the effect of that. You could really see that gold bouncing off of that background. And um, I just like the color of the metal against that, that, that background. This self-portrait I did in 2018, <clears throat> and I titled it The Messengers because I feel flowers are my message, uh, messenger in my pieces. What I'm trying to convey to my viewer about being still, about being quiet, about being reflective, taking time out of your, your schedule, your day, whatever, to focus inward and really reconnect with yourself. I think we had opportunities for that over the last year and a half with the COVID virus, um, really maybe spending more time alone than you had ever anticipated. But you know, you get to kind of know yourself a little bit more and I think I invite my viewers to do that when they're looking at my images. So I used the copper in the skin tone. I used um, aluminum in the flower petals, uh, silver in the leaves of those flowers. And I think you can really start to see the colors of the metals with this particular image. Experimenting further with tinted backgrounds. And I added a little bit of, um, I think it was yellow ochre or no, maybe orange gouache to my gesso mix. And when I was looking at this flower, it just felt so strong. You know, the, it, even though these dried flowers are really flat, fragile, it just looked very strong that the, the head of the flower is just looking up and just holding itself together there. And it just felt like, fear not. You know, we sometimes get anxious about things. I know I do. Getting really worried about this and that. And we need to just calm down and really think about it. We don't need to be anxious uh, with our lives. And further experimenting with color background, I really love the purple in this one. It, once I put that on there, I thought this is so royal looking. Um, so the title Majestic, I thought was fitting. And there's copper in the flower and silver in the leaves. And um, I just thought that this really seemed to, to suggest you know, elevated spirit. And this particular drawing also has a story. Um, it's called A Child of the Light, and it's inspired by a song that we sing in at uh, my church as entitled, I Want to Walk as a Child of the Light. And when I did this, I kind of had a vision of a, a dark flower in the middle, kind of being bathed in a white light. So I used the black and white gesso uh, to prepare this surface. But I went in with sandpaper and kind of diffused the edges between these two uh, different colors and then went back in and applied the black for the flower. And I wanted to show how when we are walking in the light, we can have strength, we can have purpose. Um, I also included this or I submitted this to a drawing competition um, earlier this year, back in March. And it was for the Jason McCoy Gallery in New York City. And the competition was called um, Drawing Challenge Number 19. And the theme of the drawing challenge was, uh, let the globe, if nothing else, say this is true, which is a line taken from the poem written by Amanda Gorman that was recited at the inauguration for uh, President Biden. And the entire quote of that stanza says, let the globe, if nothing else, say this is true, that even as we grieved, 
we grew, that even as we hurt, we hoped. And I was invited to submit a little uh, description with my entry as to why I thought this drawing was suitable for that competition. So I wrote, the year 2020 was a year of reckoning in which Americans had to face the harsh realities of social injustice. This drawing reflects the strength and fortitude of African Americans in the face of racism and inequality. The title is taken from the hymn, I Wanna Walk as a Child of the Light. One verse states, clear sun of righteousness shine on my path. African Americans have always kept their faith through centuries of racism, believing that one day they would be truly be free. The rose represents the fortitude and grace needed to persevere through adversity and suffering. The white background is the light that is needed to stay hopeful. So I really had, this drawing has a special place in my heart and uh, I really had fun experimenting with these, with these colors. And I'm never too far away from trying some watercolor. I love watercolor and opportunities to incorporate it with silver point, I'll, I'll do it. Um, this bunch of daffodils were in my studio about to fall apart. So I took a photograph because I wasn't sure that they would make it through the drawing process. And so I worked from uh, the photograph, but I really enjoyed looking at these stems because in reality, they were so fragile. But once I got the shadow in there, they started to have strength and it just, that rise up, stand tall, just seemed to be true. You know, if you just hold it together, if we work as a group, if we stay together, uh, we can hold each other up, we can lift each other up. And I, again, I think that was true during the, the pandemic that we had to really lift each other up. And uh, this one on black, um, more canis plants, but I saw these in front of the Arkansas Arts Center which is now the Arkansas Museum of Fine Arts. And uh, these leaves just look so lyrical. They just look like music. And as it, was, as it turns out, I was listening to um, The Creator Has a Master Plan by Pharoah Saunders, the jazz musician, and vocals by Leon Thomas. And I just love that song. And as I was drawing this and listening to that, I thought, you know, if we tried to create this, we would probably mess it up. And so the creator truly has that master plan and created this beautiful uh, environment for us. And I think we just need to really pay attention to that, pay attention to that. This is one of my more recent pieces um, titled Concentration and Reverberation. And as I was working with this, as I mentioned earlier, I really have to think about what I'm doing before I do it. And I was really focusing on my marks and learning how to control my tools so that I could get the form of this flower just as I wanted it. And I stepped back and looked at it and I thought, wow, this, the power of concentration is so great, you know, because it just really started to pull everything together and I could feel that energy. And I wanted to try to express that. So I went in with these marks around the flower to, to give you the feeling of that power of that energy of concentration and what that felt like to me. And so that's it. This is a, a view of my studio, which is relatively small. I don't need much space to do what I do. I'm usually sitting right there in my chair in front of the easel and I have my lighting and you can see I have a few dried flowers there and my tools are all spread out on my drawing table. And then my boom box is nearby so I can change out my CDs or, or whatever I wanna to listen to and uh, just have a very you know, kind of cool experience. And I have skylights, so sometimes I'm getting some natural light, which I appreciate, and sometimes I don't want it. So um, it's, it's a beautiful space to work in, but I, I have enjoyed my journey. And I, I thank you all again for being with us this evening and allowing me to, to share my journey with you. And if you have any questions or um, comments you'd like to make, I welcome you to, uh, to pose your questions. Thank you. That was an awesome presentation. 
Um, I will go ahead and start the questions off. Um, I know that you have a very special relationship with um, your floral portraits and flowers and flora and fauna. Um, do you think that you'll ever turn your silver point tool to other subjects? Um, do you, will you delve into more still lifes? Um, will you do more portraits? Because I love your self-portraits. So <laughs> wh where are you going? <laughs> I think I have been called to do nature. And I think if I did anything differently, maybe it was, would be to do landscapes. I've done some um, oil pastel landscapes that I've not shown, but uh, I do have some of those and sometimes I get ideas for that. But I think my mission has been to, to show things through nature. And so it, it may not always be a rose and it may be, whatever I'm seeing in my neighborhood or, or whatever, but reconnecting our energies to the divine spirit. I think that's my message. And if you are calm enough, uh, you're focused enough, and if you're willing, you can have that energy and feel that presence. Um, I, I've been often asked, will I do people? No, I'm not gonna do people. <laughs> I, I do self-portraits as a way of documenting time as it impacts me. Um, that influence comes from Kathy Colwitz, who did a series of uh, self-portraits through her life. And you could see that aging process. And so I've tried to do that every few years or so, do another self-portrait that I can see my own aging process and, and just kind of leave that record but I think I'll stick with nature. Yeah, thanks. So everyone is allowed to unmute, like that, that uh, <laughs> restriction is off. So please unmute and ask your question. I don't wanna ask all the questions. Philip, did you have a question? I do. Uh, Marge, a spectacular presentation as always. Thank so you. I wanted to, uh, I was struck at the beginning, you started off showing the beautiful flowers that you grew up with your mother's house. Uh -huh. uh, such bright colors, yet you're painting pretty much in, or drawing pretty much in grays and whites. I know some, mm -hmm. now you do some watercolor with that. Yeah. So what does that interpretation of color converted to more grays and whites, what does that mean? Is that a spiritual kind of uh, interpretation think, of the I think of that so. color or what? I think so. Well, I think when I first started doing the roses, um, I found that drawing a live rose was very difficult because it kept moving. So I let them dry and then they were still. And I had dried flowers um, from my birthday or Mother's Day. I didn't want to press them in a book because that would smash them. So mm -hmm. I started drawing them. And just drawing the form in, either in pencil or silver, I got to commune with the form. And it wasn't so much the color of it, it's about the form. Because I've, I've had white roses, yellow roses, red roses. It wasn't about that. It was the form. Mm -hmm. Looking at the cracks, the, the breaks, the bent part. Um, you know, some of them have dust on them and that impacts the value. So that was the main thing I was trying to get at. And the I think- the essence of the, fl of the flower, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think it, early on, I used to think, you know, roses look very fragile but beware of the thorn, right? The, there is strength there. So you can't judge a book by its cover. We see something and we think it's fragile. We think that we can you know, push it over, but not necessarily so. And so I, that symbolism kind of stayed with me and, and it's kind of progressed to a, a spiritual message of connecting with however you see the divine spirit. Um, I think, this past year has made me also think more about um, the struggles of, of our nation in terms of race. And I can see some images that will address that in my next few images. So I've got lots of things I'm playing with um, that hopefully you'll get to see maybe in the next year or two. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hey sis, this is uh, Charlie. Yes, sir. <clears throat> I, I want to thank you for taking us through the journey and taking me back to our childhood. 
I'm, I'm reminded so much of the time in the backyards with the four clocks and yeah. all the other flowers and how much you and mom really seemed to really get into that. But I never really noticed how much you yeah. were taking in from that experience. Yeah. But one thing I, I wanted to share about our mom and, and dad, I'm not a parent. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the responsibilities of being a parent is to recognize the gifts and talents of their children and cultivate it. Mm -hmm. and, and mom and dad certainly did that with you. I don't know quite where it started. It seems like on a, on a Sunday morning uh, and one of those inserts in the newspaper it was towards the back of that mm -hmm. little paper magazine. It was like an art contest or something. And and you and you always had a very uh, keen interest, even way back then. Yeah. And, and I think mom and dad saw that. And if I'm not mistaken, it wasn't too long after that. Somehow you got into a summer program at the Corcoran. Am I am I remembering that correctly? Well, it was at the Smithsonian. Okay, maybe that's where it was. Yeah, yeah. They uh they were offering this program to high school students and my my art teacher in high school nominated me for that. So I think every school got to nominate a student and they could attend lessons. I think, I don't know how many weeks it was, maybe four, four weeks. And we got all of our art supplies given to us. And, and that was, it was cool. We just had the run of the, of the National Museum, um, natural, right. natural History Museum. Yeah. That's right. Uh -huh. and, and speaking of, of art supplies, and I don't want to take up a lot of time sharing, uh, watching you grow in all of this, but I, I can't help but re be reminded how a lot of our Saturdays were spent. You had the car, you had the license first, <laughs> and we found ourselves in Silver Spring, Maryland at yeah. this corner art supply store. Yeah. And how we ended up going there every Saturday well. boggled my mind, but... <laughs> I get it. I get it now. That was your passion. That was your love yeah. at an early, early age. And I just want to say I'm so proud of you. I watched you do Thank this. You. Here's, here's the other thing I didn't really realize is how much science is in your artwork. Yeah. yeah. So I got I got to I got to go back and look at your work through a different lens now. I mean, oh, thank you. You, you got you got a, a, a living piece of science that that you're <laughs> hanging and so um, anyway, thank you for the journey. You've been sure. you know, a great sister. Obviously, you. love well, you, but I'm so proud of you. And thank, and thank you, you for this excellent presentation. You brought back a lot of memories. Well, I appreciate your support over the years. You you were my partner in crime when I got my car and, and going around to see things. But I'll, I'll tell you this. One thing that really struck me when we were growing up is dad would make sketches of his projects. Absolutely, he did. You know, on little scraps of paper, he might draw a cabinet or a shelf or something he was going to do. And how he got that in perspective. So I marveled at that. And I would like, you know, take some of his sketches and try to copy them. And yes, I, think you did. That, I think that had a, a lot to do with it, too. That, that as I said, they were both very creative. And, and you're creative, too, because you got the music side. Well, I got the music part from mom. Yeah. You know, our, our mom had pipes. Yes, she, she, she could she could sing. Okay. So there was a lot of art in our home. It was. We, we, we cultivated the music as well. But thanks. Love you, sis. Thank love you too, hun. All right. Other questions? Hey Marjorie. Hey. <laughs> Can you hear me? Can you all yes. hear me? Yes. So as a student of yours. <laughs> First of all, thank you for all that you taught me. It wasn't mm -hmm. Silver Point, but I learned a lot from you as well. So uh, thank you for all that you taught me. And mm -hmm. I'm just so proud. Listen, I'm retiring uh, in a couple of weeks. And over my desk at my office, uh -huh. It's one of your silver point pieces. Okay. Uh, I don't know how I'm going to leave it. I don't <laughs> know how I'm going to leave that piece at the office, but um, I'm going to have to talk to um, Aaron or somebody about how I can take that piece home with me, you know, but anyway, I, I've looked at that piece 
for years and I made sure that it hung right at my desk. So thank you thank for your work and I love you. I love you, you and AJ, uh, absolutely. And your daughters. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks Paula, I appreciate you being here tonight. Love you too. So Marjorie, it's yeah. nice to hopefully you can see and I'm coming through clearly. Yes, um, you know, I, I love your lily petals because I absolutely adore lilies and just happened to go through Garbo's gallery years ago with the girlfriend I was visiting Memphis. She picked me up in Little Rock and we went in because I'd heard about the gallery. It's like, oh my God. <laughs> and, and now everything on the black just so has been stunning too. Mm -hmm. um, but what I'm thinking about is I know that you and AJ have done some collaborations now. How has that influenced your work? If you, uh, if it has anyway, so I'm wondering. <laughs> we do look at each other's work and we'll give each other's comments and uh, I welcome his feedback. You know, sometimes he'll look at a piece and he'll see something that I didn't necessarily notice, you know, and, and uh, or maybe I'm tackling, um, you know, should I add this to it or should I leave this out? And, and he'll give me his feedback and I think, oh yeah, that's, that's a good reason, okay. So, and then he'll, he'll ask me the same thing. I'll look at his pieces and uh, what do you think? And I'll say, yeah, I think that that looks really great. Or, you know, sometimes you have to be careful with criticism and, uh, you know, he'll give me criticism and I'll give him criticism. And I'm gonna say, eh, I think that might be a little too dark. Can you lighten that up? And he'll say, yeah, you know, so we do that back and forth. Um, he's also done silver point drawings. And so we've not actually done a piece where we both worked on it, you know, but um, uh, we've had, we've shown together a lot. And I think the work is complimentary because we love drawing. You know, we both have a great respect for drawing. And even though our subject matters are different, I think the love for drawing comes through. And, and so people can, can get that from our work when we, when we show together. Yeah. Fine. Great. It's a thank you for the talk. I learned a lot and I look forward to seeing more of the work and hopefully I'll get to see you when we come through next week. Yes, be We're sure gonna... to let me know. I will. Thank you, thank lady. You. Thank you. Marjorie, I wanted thank to you. jump in here before this is over. Okay. Um, it's me. It's Vanita. Hi, Vanita. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. You good. just did the condensation of our four years at Howard. Yes. <laughs> Except for the concerts and the football games, you got everything else in there. Well, great, great. I you appreciate were, you, were my, you were my running buddy, and uh, we just had some great times once I got my car. But oh, yes. uh, you can attest to all those professors and how much of an impact they had on us. And it was just a great experience. I'm so glad that I went there. And um, you know, you, we've been known each other since what, high school? Junior high. I met you in junior high school, junior but we high got- Rebeau? Yeah. Because you went to Rebeau, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. One year at McFarland and then the rest at Rebeau. And then we came to Roosevelt and that's where we really clicked because mm -hmm. we were in Mr. Simpson's art class together. Mr. Ken Simpson was instrumental. He was so encouraging and he, he was. was introduced us to African-American art. Yes, you know, that I was can't find his, can you find his work anywhere? No, Me I either. can't, but so frustrating. He, he, you know, when, at a time when we did not see our work at the National Gallery, Yes, he was yes. telling us about the artists, um, you know, Romare Beard and Elizabeth Catlett, Benny Andrews, and, you know, so many artists, and he had materials that showed us pictures of their work. He was amazing. He you was know, amazing. Okay. And he was a mentor to my brother. Yes, yes. So um, you you were, admit, I'm sorry, go on. I was just gonna say we were blessed to have the instructors that we that we had um, high school as well as college. Oh, so yes. I appreciate all that time. And Tritobia Benjamin. Oh, yes. Oh, my goodness. Uh, it was, <laughs> it, they were tough. They, they were, were. Tough, but th we needed that. That yeah. work ethic, they all had that work ethic mm -hmm. that we needed in order to persevere through the challenges that we would face. And I try to tell that to my students, um, you know, not everybody's gonna be supportive, not everybody's gonna understand what you do, but if you give up, then you don't even have it. 
you know, yes. so you can't give it up. You have to keep it for yourself so that you can, you know, continue. And you have to find who you are. Yes. Because yes. that's the best that you're going to be is when you discover who you are and what you can do well. Yes. And that's what I've always tried to give my students, especially because I'm teaching students who are learning English. Yes. And that's a struggle for them. But, it, but that, that essence, you brought it out. And, and that's why I wanted to know. You were talking to me about coming to D.C. and doing an exhibition, if you could find the, the, the place. And have yeah. you thought of Howard? Well, that's somewhere down in my future. I'm, I've thought about it. And there are some, you know, there's some possibilities. So we'll see what might happen. Who knows? And we can do our gallery show. <laughs> Well, you know, the creator we'll has a master show plan. Opening. <laughs> he has a master plan, so we're just going to see how that unfolds. So I truly believe that. So we're going to make it happen. And I love Marjorie. You. I definitely hope to see Howard in your future. That definitely is something that must happen. Thank and you. before we wrap up, Ajawin, did you have a question? I didn't have a question. I'm just so proud of, of Marjorie, and I am a Marjorie collector. Is uh, both Garbo and Marjorie know, and uh, I saw some of those pieces you showed later on. I'm thinking, oh no, I can't buy another thing. I can't, I can't. <laughs> you, it was a beautiful, beautiful presentation. Well, thank and, you. Uh, yeah. I really enjoyed not, not only your words, as I learned a lot, like other people said, but I really love seeing the progression of your art from way back in middle eighties till just recently so thank you very much well thank you for being there dear i appreciate you being with me and uh i'll talk to you soon okay yeah we'll talk soon okay thank okay, you okay uh -huh. love you girl love you marjorie yes susan swab is here hey susan. barbara satterfield there are many artists on the line so i just wanted you to know she was here well i appreciate everybody wanted to uh congratulate marjorie on a fabulous <laughs> talk it was Thank really you. wonderful. Yeah. I'm ready to steal things from your talk. You need to show me how to insert a video the next time oh, I have to give a talk. Was, or I'll was, just let you give the talks. They're great. It was, I, I worked really hard on that. So that that's a technical issue that I learned. So I'm happy to share that. But uh, I've appreciated all that you've shared with me in terms of silver plate friendship. And I sure appreciate it. So we'll have to get together sometime soon. I hope so. Yes. Thank you. Love you. Well, one last question. I know I said, I want to know what wisdom can you impart to young artists looking to explore Silver Point and Metal Point? Well, um, be ready for a challenge. I always would tell my students, it's not hard. They would always say, Miss Smith, that's so hard. Say, nope, nope. I don't even want to hear the word hard. It's challenging. So if you can meet the challenge, you can do it. If you say it's hard, that means it's impossible and it's not impossible. So I would tell students, don't give up. You're gonna to have to be patient and take your time. Um, when I would do Silver Point workshops, students would wanna hurry and, and do things real fast and get done with the drawing in like 10 minutes. And I said, well, it's, it's, uh, it's very nice, slow down. <laughs> you know, There's so much more you'll discover when you take your time. So I would tell them, just be patient, take your time. Don't worry about how long it takes to learn it or how much effort you have to do it. If you do it over and over and over and over again, do it over and over and over again, again. You know, just keep doing it. And I tell that to any art student, no matter what your medium, don't give up, just please stick with it. And so many families are not gonna support that idea. Get a regular job and do it on the side. You know, just don't give up your art, just keep working at it. So I appreciate you for allowing artists to express themselves and show their work and share it with the community. And we appreciate, you know, the opportunities that you provide. So thank you. Well, thank you. Again, it's been a, a beautiful conversation and I hope that you take the time to come to the gallery to check out our website and to collect Marjorie's work because it is definitely exquisite and it must it should be in your collection and I'd like to thank all of the collectors on the call and all the artists who came out to support 
uh, Marjorie tonight. And our next beautiful conversation will be Sunday at 3 p.m. Anita Thomas is here. She's a wire mesh sculptor. And we're excited about her conversation coming up. And it's just been an amazing, a wonderful time to be in the gallery, to walk in and see the work of these six artists. So I, I encourage you to take some time and come and visit Hearn Fine Art. So thank you again. It's 8.15 and you have been a, a great audience and your questions have been wonderful. And again, I want to thank all of you and thank you, Marjorie and Anna. Thank you for all you do to help Hearn Fine Art continue. So thank good you. evening and God bless. Good night, everybody. Thank you again.